Hello and welcome back. And that's right, today I want to answer the very, very simple question. Why are NAS CPUs so Let's be honest, a number of you who are coming into this field of network attached storage for the first time, maybe coming off the back of a PC builder background, maybe a PC gamer, maybe someone who's just owned a few laptops in your life. One way or another, you get to the point where you're about to thwack down the money and get yourself a network attached storage device, and then you take a little look at the specifications and you see words like Celeron. You see words like Pentium. You see words like Realtek or Marvel, and ultimately you start seeing CPUs that are just disappointing by conventional to PC component standards. Whether you're owning some massive console gaming system, or you've got PCs at work and you occasionally know what systems you're using, and you know these words when you hear them for the first time, just sound a little bit paltry. They sound a bit weak. They seem kind of like, why am I spending such vast sums of money for such weak, weak old CPUs? Why is it? And that's what today's video is about. I want to explain five reasons why NAS CPUs appear so weak. Why is it when we look at network attached storage that these CPUs are the thing that make us take our finger away from the buy button and head back into the PC thing where we start putting an old PC rig together? So, Reason number one, that NASs like these ones that surround me right now, utilize relatively weak or lesser, you know, impact CPUs is nice and simple, power efficiency. These are devices that are designed to be on for days, weeks, months, or even years at a time. The CPU inside, therefore, has to be quite power efficient. You don't want it to drain loads and loads of power from your local socket outlet, much like your TV or your microwave right now, that while you're at work, chances are it's there in standby in the background, they are using very power efficient components. They sit there when they're not being used, utilizing as little power as possible. And the CPU, such as the Realtek RTD1296, such as the Intel Celeron J4125, all of these CPUs, they are very power efficient. Whether they're being utilized or whether they're being left idle, they use incredibly small amounts of power compared to the more aggressive processors that we use in day-to-day -day basis. On top of that, the degradation of hardware there when it draws too much power does shorten its life. And as mentioned, these devices are going to be on every single day, one way or another, with very brief periods where they may switch themselves off and then on again during updates. Therefore, with they being connected with power in all that time, degradation effects to their architecture, their physical architecture, may happen. And therefore, having a lower power usage and overall better power efficiency at the actual mains outlet level is how they ensure them lasting for years and years and years at a time, way, way, way beyond the manufacturer's own warranty that these devices arrive with. There's a reason why routers as well, we've got one right behind me there, routers use a similar architecture for their CPUs, because these are devices, when's the last time you turned your router off? These are things have to be on for days, weeks, months at a time, and therefore those CPUs have got to last from a power perspective. Next up, it may seem a bit counterintuitive, but the reason these NAS systems use such you know, low-end CPUs is simple affordability. You wouldn't think it when you look at these devices, and one of the main pet areas of contention is it feels like you're spending too much for a weaker CPU. It's because you've got to look at the whole system. Now, the CPUs inside these NAS boxes almost all, always arrive in a NAS with no hard drives. What you're paying for is an architecture that can run with a smaller footprint in terms of power consumption, in terms of noise, in terms of cooling and stuff like that as possible. And therefore, it's actually quite a heavily designed device. A lot of the money that you're paying for is for that design and that architecture and that long-term uninterrupted use. Now, 
the CPU inside these devices, if they did stick some high-end Xeon inside these systems, or some massive high-end 11th, 12th gen i9 processor inside these, the price point of these boxes would be astronomical. They would shoot straight up. The CPU would cost more than the rest of the architecture, whereas one brief look at even Intel's own websites, which list um, the average pricing of a lot of their processors in the market, as well as CPU Monkey and CPU Benchmark listing prices, you will see the majority of these CPUs trade hands for very small amounts of money. And ones like this, the 920 plus over here, which knocks around for about four to five hundred nicker, uh, the six bay underneath that retails for about five to six hundred nicker, and this one here for about three fifty, the Drive Store Four. These NASes, a lot of the money you're spending isn't actually going on that CPU. A lot of you think you're spending a lot for that CPU, but you're not. You're spending it for the entire architecture of that system and therefore in order to maintain that price point to be as affordable as possible it helps when these cpus come from a more affordable tier another reason that these nas brands use these arguably less impactful cpus is to do with what these systems do unlike your laptop or your phone or your pc or whatever these devices are 80 to 90 percent centered around the idea of storage yes they have other services that aren't primarily storage based such as uh, running vpn servers within them or running like background services there but almost all of the other services from vms to cloud to multimedia streaming and more are centered around data the numbers of tasks these things have to do is nowhere near as diverse as your laptop, your phone, whatever. Therefore, the CPUs don't have to be so multi-kitted, so multifunctional, and ultimately so multi-purpose as found in common PC architecture. The result is that these more mid to low tier CPUs that we see in server or server grade CPUs can get away with not having to be so diverse and therefore they don't need to be the higher end iterations of what they are that's why you see when there are for example intel core i3 5s and 7s you see older generation processors being utilized such as the 748 generation when right now in pc desktops rather than the 11th and higher and also, when it comes to graphical requirements, something that is one of the biggest kind of criticisms people have for NAS CPUs, that they aren't as graphically enabled as they might like, the graphical handling of NASes is generally considerably lower than most desktop PCs or even mobile devices. Consequently, the CPUs they use, if they do have embedded graphics, again, the majority of the Intel um, Celeron series, your Intel cores, and then you move into some of the more Radeon-powered AMD ones, those CPUs, they don't need to have egregious um, kind of high-end graphics, um, uh, uh, embedded graphics built into them there. And they can get away with moderate graphic enablement because the actual abilities of a NAS system as a whole, as far as graphics are concerned, are already quite glass ceiling to start with. And therefore, there's no point them using CPUs that can do a million squillion things that they're never going to do or have graphical capabilities that the rest of the system will never truly realize. Heading back slightly to the subject of efficiency, another reason that NAS brands use these mid-range to low-tier CPUs in their systems is to do with heat. Now, this does obviously refer back to when we were talking about these systems being on for days, weeks, months, or even years at a time. But on top of that, these systems are going to have a lot of hard drives inside. They may have a lot of SSDs inside. All of these things while spinning and wearing are gonna generate a lot of heat. Alongside that, you can have a PSU inside, again, generating heat as it's passing power through the system. And, and all of this going on with the system needing to last as long as possible, to have as little impact as possible, and as little um, uh, endurance suffered as possible. With the utilization of heat sinks rather than um, fan assisted cooling measures on processors inside, the result is that these more efficient CPUs do better in um, heat situations, in larger heat environments where they're going to have fans passing air through it, as whereas a desktop PC, when it gets to the more aggressive CPUs, have enormous combination heat sink and fan assisted 
um, uh, cooling systems along with active cooling and such. They have a large area for air to pass through all the way through it. These systems need to be petite to be small. Therefore, they've got to be as efficient as possible as temperatures rise. And again, lots of mid to low end CPUs that we talk about are the ones that do the best in those environments. Yes, they're as prone to heat as most CPUs, but they can do a lot more without raising too much power utilization, getting more out of that frequency that we'll talk about in a moment, and therefore generating less heat in of themselves and operating better in these more compact environments. And finally, that brings us neatly into power efficiency, not watts and power from the mains outlet that we've already discussed, but the actual clock speed of these CPUs themselves. The CPUs you find inside these network attached storage devices often will have much, much, much lower clock speeds than what you're used to. So the Realtek inside the drive store 4 here, that has a Realtek quad core 1.4 gigahertz processor there. The Celeron inside these two devices here has a 2.0 gigahertz frequency on four cores that can be burst up to 2.7. A lot of modern grade CPUs start in the three gigahertz. And NAS based CPUs are selected because they can get more done with less stuff being utilized. They are more efficient and that ties in neatly into the heat generation that ties into the active cooling that ties into the less power being used from your mains outlet and ultimately when it comes to all of these points simply comes down to sustainability these devices lasting for as long as possible and if they use more aggressive cpus then that lifespan is likely going to go down slightly if they use more aggressive cpus the power utilized is going to go up and the efficiency is likely going to go down. There are, of course, exceptions to the rule. If we look at more enterprise-grade rack mounts and more, some of these use of incredibly powerful hardware inside. Multi-CPUs inside, 12 and 16 core Xeons. Now, those are systems that are doing big-end stuff. They are doing, um, you know, systematic and, um, high, you know, high uh, hypothesizing weather reports they're doing physics they are doing high-end AI transactions with flash those are systems that have grown way 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 out of proportions of the NASA's NASA's here I have on the table and therefore they're not really a fair comparison for what we're saying but when it comes to most desktop solutions they're never gonna be needed for those high-end tasks so why would you stick the Ferrari engine inside a shop car that's just going to go down the road three times a week. There's just no point. But this has been, why do NAS drives have such terrible CPUs? If you have been looking forward to this video, I've talked about it for a little while. I hope you found it helpful. I know it doesn't answer all your questions and I mean, nothing's black and white. It would be lovely to see a lot more aggressive CPUs in this or at least a choice. But if you've enjoyed this, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe and the bell to be notified. And take advantage of the free advice section over on NAS Compares by using the free advice section linked in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.